What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? It's Jason Jenny. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we are going to unwrap being creative and how being creative can help your business. How a good friend of mine, Matthew from Holy Shit Stationery, not just started his business, but has really changed the way he operates, focusing in on the creative part of business. I wanted to sit with him and present it here on the channel because I believe there are so many golden nuggets in this conversation. And that's gonna be a longer video for this channel, but I think it is jam packed with a ton of takeaways that we as DJs can benefit from. Matthew is someone that we've had speak at the DJ Collective Experience now a number of times, and every time he's knocked it out of the park. So I'm gonna stop right here and just jump right into it. Check out this conversation between me and Matthew from Holy Shit Stationery. You know, even just to jump right into it, I feel that the DJ industry itself is an industry as a whole that almost lacks representation in the creative part of the process yeah. of of pricing of just you know doing your best work I, I think those are like that's like my mantra for the, for this year for a lot of different reasons right and, yeah. and and what does that mean right like so before i go into like hammering out questions about your creative process why it's important how to how to like even rewrap the way that maybe people have done things a million for a million years in our industry. Right. Why don't I just start off by like asking you a little bit about holy shit stationary and just how you kind of came online. And if you can give, give, um, if you can kind of put together like, um, you know, like an executive summary, like the first yeah, page totally. on your electronic press kit. I think that would be I love it. to kind of cut in. Totally, totally. So uh, all of my education is in music. Um, I have a, an undergrad degree in music education, and I went to grad school to be a jazz bass player. Like they actually give master's degree in jazz bass of all things. Um, and I wasn't very good at it. Like I, I kind of hustled my way into a grad assistantship that got me into my grad program. Uh, and I graduated from grad school, probably performing at the level of like a, a, a mid uh, upperclassman undergrad degree. Like I just... Um, I realized that it wasn't something that came innately to me, but in the process, I discovered a lot about creativity and about connecting with humans and, and, and fell in love with this idea of ritual. Um, our parents and their parents in the name of progress, got rid of all the rituals in their lives. They stopped wringing chicken's neck for dinner, right? They stopped honing and stropping razors to shave and everything's disposable. And, um, and my grandpa was born Amish and got shunned for buying a truck and hiding it in a corn. I guess it was in the woods. And um, I really resented that when my grandpa died, there was very little left of him, right? Like this is a culture, he was, he was born of the depression. He was born into a culture that made things that lasted and modern society killed all of that. It took all of that away. And when he passed, I have one object left of his, which is a whole super cool story about him getting injured on a, on a farm implement. Uh, but um, I saw this thing where weddings in particular, this ritual that we still have, it's this moment where we all come together. And I believe that the artifacts of a ritual are the thing that keep us connected to it a year, five years, 10 years down the road. And I saw this place where people were creating stationery that just got thrown away. Like even your mom is not hanging your wedding monogram on her wall. You know, it's just not a mm -hmm. thing you do. Somebody will put it in a drawer for a little while and then you know, one year they do a junk drawer clean out and out goes the invitation. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, you're looking for those moments to connect you to this part of your life. And so I, I, I started doing this thing where I'm trying to be creative and do design work and create these things. And what I realized is the further and further I went into it, the more I realized that the average person isn't looking for that. And it's a very special person that understands the power of an inanimate object to transform their emotional state and to, to shape shift them. And so I decided I only wanted to work with those people, which requires a certain mindset. And the reality is to create this moment that connects them to their guests requires a level of investment that the it's above average, right? At a minimum, it's above average. And so as my ideas started to grow to create impact that like the reality is, um, emotional impact, I think comes through either a really crafted message or a really unexpected experience, preferably both. Um, and my goal was to create a moment for my clients. I found out that my clients love 
to create moments for their people, right? They're not there to be, to, to like show off. Yeah, they're gonna flex a little bit, but they're not looking for like the ego stroke. They're looking to give their community a, the best time they've ever had in their lives. And if, if we don't send an invitation that makes people go, holy shit, this is gonna be a killer party, I've missed something. And so I just decided, uh, my dad is a pastor and he cried the first time I said, holy shit, stationary. And I tried golly G and all sorts of other stuff, but there's just something about the impact of that saying, you know, I really, I, literally I had people texting me going, my mom got this thing and said, holy shit, I'm like, that's it. This is, this is the win. And so I've just kind of devoted my life to it. And you were talking earlier about something that made me think of the, you were talking about numbers, right? Like we don't necessarily always need the biggest numbers. Seth Godin talks about minimum viable audience. And it's what is the fewest number of people that I can create for that I can absolutely surprise and delight. And my goal is to do no more than 10 projects a year and do them for people who are, who are wholly bought in on, on this idea that an inanimate object can change their state of being and change the relationship between them and their guests. So that's what I pursue all day long. And I love it because I think just like the DJ world, there are a number of profile entertainment professionals that are incredibly selective on the events that they take on. But yeah. just like the DJ world, there is a considerable amount of our population that literally fights to, and sometimes on they fight their way to the bottom to stuff their calendars with as many possible events as possible, yep. which essentially restricts the ability to almost be creative at a certain level because you're not able to invest the time, the energy, or the process into um, really cr the creative. And I can draw an analogy from entertainment and stationary in a number of different ways, but I think that's why I, I embrace this message that you kind of have cast it out to the world. And I think I've connected to it myself as I figure out my plans for my life because I've been in the hustle for a long time and i've yeah. been someone that has cr crammed my calendar with as much as i can put into it uh -huh. but now i'm really like concerned with not just doing volume i'm trying to do the right volume for the right people and, th and that's yeah. a unified message here right it totally is uh, the, the very first like there are a lot of reasons why you shouldn't be cramming your calendar but i think the very first one is um if you're a creative there is a level of mutual trust required for you to do your best work right the, the client has to trust that you can deliver on your promise and you have to trust that the client has bought into your worldview that they are going to trust your your decisions that they are going if you have to improvise in the set that they trust your improvisation they're not going to give you uh, a massive list of do not plays and a massive list of plays or even very specifically a list of play these and this orders which literally undermines every bit of credibility and authority you have as a creative so the first step is you've got to uh, attract clients who want you for your very specific perspective right and that means you have to um you have to decide who you're for and who you're not for um seth godin says people like us do things like this and if you're saying a message that's very specifically for people who buy into your worldview by default you have to be turning away more people than you're taking in you just have to because you're one unique person with a very unique perspective and not everybody's going to align with that but when they align they have complete trust in what you do and you get to do your best work or at least have the opportunity to you know it's up to you to show up and do it but if you don't have the opportunity to because you're cramming your calendar full of people who want you because you've got a, a reputation for being cool or for you know your pricing or for being the one everybody wants they're not hiring you for your perspective. They're hiring you for something that has nothing to do with your actual creative energy. Now, and I love that. And this doesn't just happen overnight. I think you no. have to go through the process of earning the experience and yeah. investing the time in the craft to, to get to a certain point where you have the ability of getting to this creative space that Yes. may be challenging for others to get to or even to wrap their minds around. And I can say that I'm going to post this on my YouTube channel, and I am sure that there are people watching this as I'm talking right now saying, what are they talking about? Like, that doesn't make sense. It's not my world. And right. this world is not for everyone, and that's that's the beauty of it. There are so many different ways that anyone can be successful by however they define success in their own totally. definition, right? So. Yeah. 
So talk to me about like your, I guess the, 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 the process that you've went through to get to this creative space where you can limit your calendar to just 10 as in what it was like maybe before when it was maybe 40 or 60 or 80 or a hundred. And yeah. um, if you could maybe elaborate in the, in the conversation to maybe some of the struggles that you went through, just kind of changing the way and re rewrapping the way you've been kind of moving your business along. Totally. Yeah. It's um, I think one of the things that business owners in general struggle with and especially creative kind of right brained people is, is clarity in the path right? We just, we, sometimes we, maybe it's FOMO, there's a, maybe it's ADHD, but it's like, it's hard to go, this is the path that I want to take. I'm going to commit to this path long enough to see results. Um, especially when you're starting out and you don't know what you want, which is why you're talking about like, you have to like, you have to pay your dues. You have to show up and do whatever kind of work it takes to understand what work you don't want and do, do want. And so for me, what it looked like, it was actually um, Mike McCallowitz, the pumpkin plan kind of changed my life. Yeah. And it was the long and short of it is it's a book that uh, um, uses the analogy of the guys who grow like those car size prize winning pumpkins as a way to grow your business to be the business you want it to be. And his I think it's like his very first exercise is you take your top revenue producing clients and you run them through this matrix through this rubric of like a grade system. And it's things like. Uh, what grade do you give on your desire to pick up the phone when they call? Like, does your heart race because you don't want to talk to them? Are you excited to talk to them? Things like that. And when I started my business, because I've got all this like print, these printing presses behind the camera here, I'm idea, design, production. I'm an all-in-one, one-stop shop. And when I started, I was like a printer who happened to do this other stuff. And most of my work was printing other people's things. And I realized that for me, I had clients that, that were, you know, I had $30,000 a year clients. And I realized that when I did this rubric, I was miserable working for these people. And before this work, I would have thought they were my best clients. And when I stopped and actually took the time to think about what I was doing for them, I realized I was miserable. And, and the work that wasn't quite the highest paying was the ones that lit me up the most. And I had to figure out how to convert that into higher paying work. And that's when I started to go on this quest and realize that the real thing that I was missing was uh, the trust that comes from them understanding my worldview. If they understand the way I see the world and they happen to see the world the way that I do, then we can start this path of trust. And when you get to that point, people will pay whatever it takes because they want you. They want the best, not the best overall, the best for them. And so I started to go down this path of um, talking about the work that I wanted to be doing even before I was doing it. These are the things that I'm trying to do. And sometimes it was like, sometimes I could afford to create some little showcase pieces. One of the things I love about your world is all these guys that are doing just these really killer mixes as reels or TikToks. And, you know, it's cool that they've got this big audience, but what I'm really interested in is when they do something that requires a very unique perspective when they're doing it because it's their particular musical taste or their understanding of rhythm and interpolation, or maybe they're focused on like lyrical connections. When, when they do that and they do it consistently, then you know who that person's about and you can start to see that's their worldview. And so the thing I realized is the more I share my worldview, um, uh, oh, and very particularly, a lot of my work comes directly from wedding planners because I find that the couples who are investing in their weddings at a point that invest at the dollar amount that I want, if I only want 10 a year and I, like in an ideal world, I think my, my perfect uh, gross is probably about half a million dollars, right? So that means on average, I need $50,000 a project if I'm doing 10 a year. Well, the couple that spends 50,000 on stationary is going to have a wedding planner. They're not mm -hmm. because that, that wedding is going to be a million dollar wedding or an eight hundred thousand dollar wedding. I think it's I think one of the key things that I'm unwrapping from this is you really have um, like an ideal client almost or an ideal couple in terms yeah. of who they are, their profile, what they're about, what they believe in, what what they're into. Uh, do, yeah. Would you say that that's accurate or? It's it's super accurate, and I've 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 honed that over the years, partly by literally asking them. I've literally called up some of my favorite clients. Well, I've emailed them and said, "Hey, I would just love to ask you some questions because I want more clients like you. I want to clone you. 
how can I get more like you? And just ask them some really direct questions about how they see the world. And they started to reflect back to me some things that I had been thinking, but hadn't been saying and realized that I had been giving off this vibe with these things. And if I learned to talk about them explicitly, it would help new clients understand my worldview better. And so then the thing that I think is super important, and I, you know, one of the things that I'm really blessed with is when I get to the point where I'm on a phone call with a client, I have like, with a potential client, I have like a 90, 95% close rate. If we get all yeah. the way to the phone call, we're in, like it's happening. And the reason I've done that is because every touch point along the way is a chance for me to tell them I'm not for you if you are not like this. Um, and one of the ways that I do that is in my inquiry form. So my people believe in the power, I, I said this earlier, of an inanimate object to transform their emotional state. And so typically that comes up in art, architecture, and food. That's the place that it happens for me a lot. So in my inquiry form, I ask as few of the demographic and wedding detail questions as possible. For me, dates don't matter, right? I can have two weddings on the same date. It's not gonna change anything for me. For a DJ, it might. If you're if you're a single op, you gotta know if you're available. I get that. Right. But I, yeah. I don't need to know what city it's in, what venue it's at. I don't need to know that up front because I'm really interested in, do they see the world the way that I do? Because if they do, and they've seen my content, then they know that they can trust me to carry them down this path together to create our best work together. So I ask a question like, um, uh, has a work of architecture ever moved you emotionally? Tell me about that experience. Is there an artist, artist or piece of art that gives you incredibly strong feelings? Tell me about that. And if they're like, oh man, Damien Hurst and his butterflies piss me off because of, I'm like, okay, yeah. they've got opinions about inanimate objects and it causes them to be emotional, then they're gonna get the way I see the world. They're gonna understand that this freaking piece of copper I'm gonna send as an invitation is gonna get people really excited or at least get a strong reaction. And so every step of the way, I'm way more concerned in what, what they call the psychographics than the than the demographics. I wanna know that they see the world the way I do because it's completely legitimate for someone to see the world differently. I'm just not for them. So what, what have been some of the struggles maybe that you've gone through moving from like doing and doing the work for the masses to really yeah honing in on this ideal couple, ideal situation, ideal event, ideal, you know, stationary project. What yeah. were some of the hardest struggles, if you will, and maybe if you could elaborate a little bit on how you overcame those struggles and how they worked yeah. themselves out? The number one is when you move into this world, you have to deliver every time you have to have a promise and you have to deliver on that. And so the number one for me has been, I just have to show up consistently. Um, I have to be the same person on a phone call that I am when I'm designing, that I am when I'm ideating, that I am, I, I install stationary day of because I'm always jealous of you guys getting to be at the event and do the hang and how much you get to see how you could have done better by getting live feedback. So now I do that, I show up at my events, but it, the very first thing is now I'm on the hook. Um, uh, my, one of my business coaches talks about big asks for big promises, right? I have big promises that I'm going to deliver holy shit stationary that allows my couples to be known and remembered by their people. If I'm only doing 10 of those a year and making that promise, I have to deliver every time. And so I've, I've had to create this kind of like hedge of protection around me that says, you don't get to get into my world unless you've bought in on this. Um, and that was really scary. And I'll tell you, I failed a few times at doing this up front. And it was a really hard lesson. And a lot of what I realized was I didn't do a good job of setting up the communication around who I am and what I do. And so I'm to the point now where I would rather scare away 10 good clients than let one bad client through. I would much rather scare away the bad ones. The other thing that's been really hard and challenging is the emotional aspect of when you get really clear about who you're for, you stop getting as many inquiries as you used to get. Now on a, on a um, like, uh, not a production level, on like a management level, that's super helpful. You're, you're just, you're spending less time fielding bad inquiries. Um, on an emotional level, when you go from getting 20 inquiries a month to five inquiries a month, three inquiries a month, that's scary. But when those inquiries are so much better and when they get you so much closer to a, a, a yes from the right client, you can take a step back and breathe and go, all right, I'm doing the right thing. 
and and I would assume, and I could base it on my own personal kind of experiences and experiences with my team at SCE, as we've started to elevate our experience level, right? The expectations change. That's like yeah. one of the first things that I communicate to my team when we shift through investment points, right? When we move from one level to the next level, the first thing is yeah. how is this going to change for them? Because you can't do the same show what right. you were doing to what you will be doing now. And and usually that the investment of time and the creative is the, the tipping point where you have a little yeah. bit more access, you have a little bit more um, ability to do different things. And I think that message is super strong, but I would assume that you in the qualification process are almost letting them know f- what the investment could be. And I, yeah. I, ideally it wouldn't be isol- you know, it wouldn't be specific for that event, but you know, I would assume that there's a significant investment up front that will weed out anyone that's price conscious or not on kind of the right level in terms totally. of expectations, correct? Yeah. So there are two principles that I learned that have helped me a ton. One is your business, uh, the structure of your business says more about what you value than your words ever will. So for every DJ that, that charges like um, uh, a reservation fee, what they're saying is the most important thing is the date. It's just me showing up, right? It's me showing up with my gear and playing music. And if that's what you think is the most important thing, then that can work. But I think for a lot of us, what we believe we're bringing to the table is our unique perspective, the way we think about what we do, whether it's music or stationary or whatever. And when we don't charge something for that, uh, our clients understand that there's some value, but they determine what it is. And they are typically going to undervalue the creative part of it, which means that they undervalue the quality of your decisions and they're more likely to undermine you. So the very first thing is you charge for the things you believe you do better than other people. So if you've got a really great sense, if you can like suss out who a couple is up front and do all of these things you charge for, if you've got, uh, this sounds stupid, I get it. And and like, how do you line item this? You line item it as a creative fee. You line item it for, I am spending time focusing on making something for you. That alone is valuable. Um, you know, people who charge based on, on the quantity of things, on hours or the amount of equipment. And like, that's their sole focus. Uh, Very often they're penalized for being really good at what they do. You know, uh, a graphic designer who charges hourly, they, that means that them being efficient at their work ultimately is valued less. So we have to think really intentionally about how we do the, 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 the structure of our business. The other part of it that's really powerful is the idea of creating, um, a series of like one-way valves and decision-making that narrows down the focus. So for me, what that looks like is my clients pay a creative fee up front because I believe that my ability to think about, did you see that Rick Rubin interview with um, um, Anderson Cooper where he's like, so what do you get paid for? And he essentially got paid. He said, I get paid for my confidence and my taste, right? <laughs> like yeah. that's essentially it, right? It's, I believe that I can think about your thing in a way that nobody else can, and that's valuable. So I charge up front, I charge a creative fee. And in my, I, have, I give people a 10 minute sales call and that's all we get unless I really like hanging out with them. Um, which usually if, if it's a yes, it'll go longer. But um, all I'm telling them is what my process looks like. And I'll give them a range of like for your size wedding, we're going to be in, and that range is massive. That range might be twenty to seventy thousand dollars, and it's they pay me the creative fee, and I say it's going to be twenty to seventy thousand dollars, and they say yes or no, and when they say yes, then I go back into my corner. We have a, a really great creative, uh, like a brief meeting, um, a discovery call, and um, during that process, I'm learning to narrow the focus as I go. So if I start by saying it's going to be twenty to seventy thousand dollars, and I don't know what it is, the next communication I have with them says, okay. Last time we talked, you paid my creative fee. I told you it was going to be this range and I would come back and tell you what it's going to be. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet, but I know that we're going to use wood because it, it's important in this way. And the range is going to be forty to $60,000. I've, I've got a little more detail to get to yet. And then the next call is a full design presentation where I give them that it's going to look like wood that's laser engraved this way and cut this way. And it's going to cost you, you know, $58,000 period. And so by giving them those moments along the path, I get buy-in at every step. 
Um, and, and, you know, enthusiasm for the idea is a huge part of it, but it's really about creating these one-way valves and this buy-in that says, I'm the expert and I am passionate about creating a solution for you and they will pay you along the way for it. I, uh, I, I, I love everything about that. You know, I follow another business creative and I, I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with him. His name is, uh, on Instagram, it's, uh, the Chris do it's Chris do right so oh yeah yeah, does, yeah the future yeah he, he he does some amazing amazing stuff and you know he I saw him do, release a reel in which he was discussing his fees and he's like uh -huh. the investment to do to work with someone like me is this and he says you don't need to justify yourself you didn't he's like that is the cost and yeah. I've watched a number of his pieces of uh of of, of content and I just really appreciate his view, which is very much in line with what you're saying. You know, like a, a business creative and the creative process for some might take longer than others, but you don't know until you go through it. And if you are pricing yourself per hour, you're essentially selling yourself short. If you're yeah. using the same amount of energy, it might not be the same amount of time, but it might, it just, you, you need to account for the years of experience that brought you up to that point, yeah. which I know in the DJ world is something that most people don't understand, you know, yeah. and, and for someone that's done this for a greater part of their life at this point, it's something that really hits home for me, you know? Yeah. It, how many DJs allow their client to tell them how much time they need? Right. Right. Uh, how, how are you the expert? If you've got someone who's never hired a DJ saying, I need you for X hours. You've by, immediately by, by being that person, what you're saying is I'm your hired gun. I'm not an expert and you probably are an expert and you're just afraid to admit it and, and stand in the authority of your expertise. Instead, if what you do is you understand their event and you go based on everything you've told me, this is the range of time I'm going to be there. And by the way, I don't have to nickel and dime you over the time because I'm just going to commit to up to this many hours. And if it's less than that, because it creates a better flow for your event for me to end at this point than to stretch it out for another hour, right? Uh, have you ever heard the, the study about how the first and the last of an event are the things people remember the most and they did it with proctology exams. Have you heard this before? No, I haven't. I, haven't. I, for, I forget what book it was in. I read this, but they said that they did this study where uh, if you're going to the proctologist, right, and you're getting scoped, if they just leave the scope in for five minutes at the end and they don't jiggle the thing around and make you uncomfortable, then when they take it out, the satisfaction rate, like the, the level of, of like positive feelings that people had about their experience skyrockets because they weren't being like manhandled and uncomfortable at the end. So how many DJs are like, I committed to X hours because this is the way my contract is written. And the end of that night starts to fizzle because people are tired. And you know, the, the couple read the room wrong or didn't think about who their people were. And we're so afraid of um, displeasing a client that we allow them to to do our job for us. And if instead we stand on our authority and go, you know, I hear what you're saying. I know that that's what you want. In my experience, every time we get to this point in an evening, we lose the energy and people, the, 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 the memories they have start to fade a little bit. If instead we do this, we wind up ending on a high note and everybody winds up with even better memories. When you're able to speak in that authority, you get to charge for it. Yeah, and, and that's awesome. So if you were to give, and I want to talk about kind of your upcoming um, platform release and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and thing that you have going on, I'm, I'm super excited about. But like, if you were to kind of loosely give someone that's in a different field, same industry, just different world, if you were talking to DJs and, you know, you were going to give them advice on kind of rewrapping their business and valuing the creative of their business as opposed to just you know widget in widget out business yeah. line item style contracts you know way of doing things what would be maybe your first or or what would be your first step or what would be one tip that you would offer someone just to re-look at the way that they've been operating yeah okay my number one favorite uh is anything that you say about your business that the opposite couldn't be true isn't worth saying and we need to lean into the things where the opposite could be true for a different person so what that means is any dj that says i get the asses on the dance floor tell me a dj who's not going to say that 
It doesn't right. exist, right? Everybody wants to get people dancing. But if you're like, I want to make sure that the music that I play connects to um, an entire range of age from, you know, from little kids to the 80 year old grandpa, or if it's, I, I want to hit nostalgia because I'm super into nostalgia. Well, it's just as legitimate to say, I only wanna play modern bops because I want people to sing along to the things they're listening to on the radio. Those two things are both viable options. And as you start to think about what are the things that I can say about my business that someone could say the opposite, then you start to get clarity about your messaging. And that's the number one. If you're not clear about who you are and who you're for, nobody's going to pay attention because you just look like everybody else. And when you look like everybody else, you're, uh, you're based on your, the decisions are based on price or cool factor or whatever. They're not based on perspective. So if you can say, I believe this thing about the way that I work and it's different than my friend who also does this and just sees it differently, lean into that, learn to tell better stories about that. And you'll start to attract people who only want that. And how important is storytelling in this creative process, in your opinion? It is absolutely number one, because uh, well, I was just talking to a friend this morning. What we're essentially doing is trying to make the intangible tangible, right? I mean, literally, you are dealing with sound waves that people can't see. You're dealing with emotions. Your Music isn't something people can grab. And so the only way that you can get that uh, the, the point of what you do across is by telling better stories. And for me in the DJ world, what it looks like is literally you have to talk about moments on the dance floor and, and how they were important and emotionally how they were important, how they connected uh, a, a, a bride to one of her parents, uh, how they connected to families from disparate cultures, whatever it is, when you start to tell those stories so people can see themselves in those stories, which means you have to know who your clients are, right? You have to know what they value. And when you start to see that and tell really great stories, the, rea the reality is that's what selling is, is telling better stories and then delivering on the promise of those stories. You know, it's it's so funny because we, I call them oh shit moments, right? And I want yeah. oh shit moments at least throughout my entire set. An example, uh -huh. case in point, um, last Saturday I worked on Long Island. Now I work on Long Island every so often. It's one of my least favorite places to work anywhere on in terms of okay. location because of the way that someone from New Jersey has to travel there with a commercial vehicle, it just uh -huh. becomes very challenging. So like, yeah. you know, there's a whole onset of stress that we have to deal with every time we work on Long Island. The parties are always great, but it's about knowing your audience, right? And I'm yeah. playing EDM and craziness and everyone's going nuts on the dance floor. And in the middle of the, 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 the madness, I break into an acapella kind of redrum edit of Uptown Girl by Billy Joel. And anyone okay. from Long Island would know that Long Island is very Billy Joel, as opposed yeah. to New Jersey being very Bruce Springsteen or very right. Bon Jovi, right? So you hear, oh, 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 oh. And the whole room is like, literally, yeah. like from Aunt Brenda to Uncle Steve to the people that are in their 20 somethings on the dance floor are all going crazy. And we have Gabby on the sax playing, and she's from Long Island. Everyone's going crazy. But that I love to me it. is like an oh shit moment. And it's about understanding your craft. So I, the way I wrap this from a DJ perspective is I always ask a number of questions. I just did a video that I shared up on the channel, three or four questions to help you crush the music. And it's really about understanding who you're working for, yeah. and where they're from, how old they are, and then almost profiling where they grew up. How, how, when did music influence yes. them the most, right? Based on studies and, and ages and, and where they come from and how they party and all the, is it work people or is it family? And uh -huh. is there 11 brothers and sisters on the father's side or are the parents yeah. separated? Like all of these things impact the overall energy. So yeah, I love what you're saying here because it ties into a lot of things that I can tell you firsthand that relate to my world in the entertainment space from a creative perspective that totally. asking the right questions and understanding their story allows me to storytell at the yeah. end of a celebration. I always say, I don't want people to be like, Hey, that I want them to say that was a great DJ, but I don't want them to be like, you know, that was just a vendor. I want them to be like, how do you know him? And how does he know you guys? Like, yeah. who does he know? Because it felt so authentic and so 
natural. And so how did he know us so well? How did he know us so freaking well? Exactly. Yes. Did you grow up around the corner or is it because I feel that there's a value in that kind of relationship that goes far beyond just playing music for four hours at a reception and then calling it a day, moving on to the next one. Right. It's about understanding the, 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 the the family dynamics, understanding the good and the bad, understanding where, where, what makes them tick, what they're into, what they're not into and, and really going beyond, which I, I, I just love. So that's a, Great piece of advice, I guess, getting back to what how this whole question started. And, and yeah. I love the creative process. Now, let's talk a little bit about your upcoming project. I think that would be a great place to kind of go with this now because there are probably a number of people of watching this right now saying, I don't, even though you've kind of given me the thing to think about, I don't even know how I would approach this because the foundation of my business is almost rooted in cement to do things very differently. Yeah. So I want to talk about your upcoming project, which I am very proud of you for releasing. And I'm very anxious to hear and see how it goes with people looking to really expand on the creativity side of their own small business and not yeah. just DJs, anyone, right? Anyone. Anyone watching yes. This. Yes. Um, so, you know, the thing is, I think most of us have this in us. Um, I, I view this kind of like therapy. Sometimes we just have to talk it out. Uh, sometimes the things that come so naturally to us are don't feel special because they're so natural to us. And it takes someone else going, whoa, do you see this thing about yourself? That's amazing. Or to go, did you hear the words that you just said? Do you hear how important that sounds to you? So I am putting together a, a 20 week um, I, I haven't, I'm not even sure what to call it besides like a mastermind, right? 20 week mastermind, a very small group of people. And what we're going to do is every week we're going to hop on a call and we're going to do 30 minutes of uh, kind of lesson and open Q and a, and then we're going to put two people in the hot seat every week and everyone's going to get multiple turns. And the idea is we're going to get clarity on this whole through message from who are my ideal clients and what do they have in common specifically in terms of psychographics? How do they see the world? And then how does what I do specifically match with what they need? And how do we tell that story better? One of my favorite things to do, and I, the very first time I did it was actually at the DJ Collective in Arizona with uh, with a DJ there who was talking about his origin story. And it just seemed so like natural to him that he didn't see the beauty in it. And I went, hold on a second, what you're telling me is, and replayed the thing he just told me in a way that was maybe a little more concise in language and a little more emotional in the appeal. And he goes, oh my God, that's my messaging. And so we're going to get that messaging for everybody. I believe every single creative, every business person, but every creative should have a framework that says, I do X for Y so that. Mine is, I make holy shit stationary for brave and daring clients so that they can be known and remembered by their people. And when you build out that framework, everything that I talk about hangs on one of those things. And I can talk for days about each single one of those things because it influences every decision that I make, but I can say it in a clear way that, first of all, it helps me remember, right? It helps me like hang my hat on something, but it also, you're gonna remember that I make holy shit. You may not remember all the parts of it, but you're gonna remember a couple of them. And when you remember a couple of them, then the next time I say it, it starts to fill in the gap. So we're gonna give that framework to every single person. And in the end, we're gonna uh, talk about what is the strategy to find the people who that message resonates with. And we're gonna do it in a small group. I've got some people outside of the events industry that are already coming on board that we're, it, some of the smartest people I've ever encountered who are, are going to do this thing with us. And I am so freaking excited. It's going to be Tuesdays from uh, 1.30 to 3 EST. It starts in mid-March and uh, it's going to be 3,500 though. If you join in kind of where I'm, I'm in pre-launch right now, it's $3,000 through the end of uh, February. And um, where can people find information on this? Is it on your Instagram? Is it on your website? Where would someone go to learn more or to maybe ask a question to you and just kind of just kind of see if this could be something that would benefit their business? Totally. Instagram is the quickest and easiest way to get there. I prefer to have conversations about this, right? I don't want a sales page. I don't, this isn't a funnel. I want to make sure that you are going to receive the most value you can out of it. I would much rather scare you away than, uh, than bring you in and you not get value out of it. And so, uh, they can hit me at a fine press on Instagram and, uh, shoot me a DM and we'll have a conversation about it, pick up the phone and make sure it's a fit. Uh, but I am so excited about what this is going to be. 
And I know you have a YouTube channel here. What is that a fine press as well? It is, it is. And I'm spooling that back up. This was a, a lesson that I learned. I got these sexy presses. And when you pop a slow motion video of a sexy press, graphic designers and, and uh, other printers love it. But this is a way more important part of the story. I can teach anybody how to print. Anybody can you know, go to YouTube and figure that out. It's this storytelling, the emotional thing. So I'm kind of revamping the, the, the way I'm doing my YouTube channel to talk about these things. Well, you know, I, 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 I've now seeing i've gotten to know you over the past couple of years on a number yeah. of different projects we've had you involved with the dj collective now multiple times and the feedback has been outstanding and to see and listen to your message this coming year it truly like i believe almost mind bent the room in a positive way and i, I, I feel it. like you know, I wanted to have you and do this type of interview and kind of just recording sessions so that additional people that are connected to me in my space could get access to your message, to your business, and even just you as a person, because I think you are someone that is awesome to follow. And I really appreciate not just your content on Instagram and the messaging, and just the, the things about you, your your watch, um, your, your love for watches and, <laughs> right? and all of, and, and, and style and all that good stuff. But I really do appreciate even your YouTube channel because I did get served with one of your videos and I did watch it where, you know, you make your fresh, uh, uh, your pressed coffee and, you know, you uh -huh. had really like told a story with that. And it was good enough to keep me locked in to see what you were doing. And to be very candid, I, I saw the other video that you shared from the DJ Collective, you know, and I just thought it was awesome. And I think that your knack for storytelling and the creative processes is just something that more people in our world need in their lives. So I really wanted to be able to just kick it with you. And I appreciate your time and energy and everything that you do. And I think we should do this again um, in the future, maybe before yes. you launch your program this March and, and, and just share some more insight perspective. And if there's anyone watching this, I want to put Matt's information underneath this video so that you can link up with him and if you have anything at all that you'd like to add to this conversation, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to do so in the comments underneath this video. I think um, Matt will be on the lookout for them. I will be on the lookout oh, wow. for them. And we will try to answer questions that people may have because I am sure the minds are moving of people watching this saying, wait a yeah. minute, like, is this even what Jason's doing now? Is this what he's doing? And I can say that after learning from people like Matt and reworking my business with people like Brian and, and speaking to people like Sean Lowe and following people that are incredibly creative, Andrea Eppolito, amongst a number of other people that have become friends of mine. I, I've actually had to rework the way that I've been working for so long because yeah. this is what makes the most sense for me. And it's not going to make sense for everyone and it's not for everyone. And that's totally cool. But yep. I believe that challenging thoughts and even change is great in terms of business evolution and just purpose. Right. And, totally. and that's what all this kind of ties to. Is there anything that you want to say before we close out of this video? Because I know that we do have a meeting coming up in just about we five do. minutes or so. Oh, man. Um, a, another meeting. Is there anything that you would like to, to say to anyone about the course, about the, the information in terms of following or anything at all that I can help you deliver before we close out of this? Yeah, I, I believe that what AI is going to do in the event industry in the next five years is going to make the things that we're talking about right now literally the only way you can sell. Um, I believe that the the machines will be able to deliver what the average couple in America wants really well for a much lower price point, and they're just gonna they're gonna go with it. And you know who those clients are, right? You, we know the ones that don't quite value it, but they'll spend the money. Uh, big tech is gonna cannibalize a lot of that. And the thing that will help us thrive in this brave new world, just the way digital photography didn't replace film photography, but it totally upended the industry and made people rethink things. I think AI is going to push us into telling better stories about how our humanity affects our art. And if you're not doing this thing, find a way to tell better stories, even if it's not this story. Um, because there is so much about to change in the way we do our work. And also, AI can make your work a million times better if you learn how to harness it.
Unbelievable. And what is your favorite AI resource now? I, I, I know there's a million of them out there. Do you have a favorite that you could uh, share with us? I, I, for one, if you have not asked chat GPT, how you can use it very specifically, go do that today, go sign up for chat GPT and ask it as a DJ who is in this market doing this, how can I use you? And it will give you an answer specific to you and start to use that. I think, uh, uh, that's going to be a killer for us in the next couple of years. I'm waiting for, uh, one of the major, uh, uh music services to offer something that that's just going to change your world entirely. Side note, I have a video on AI coming out on this channel very soon. And if you I haven't it. seen it, I want to point you over there. But I spend my mornings and I either walk or I do my elliptical or I whatever. I don't even have the music on in my garage kind of workout area anymore. All I do is talk with chat GBT. Like I just I love it. have a conversation with the AI of the world. Yeah. And I my conversation always starts off in one place. And I end up in a totally different place. And it is so insane what is available yeah. just on your phone as long as you have access to the internet. It's just insane. So I love that you mentioned that. Awesome. Maybe we, we could do a follow-up, just talk about AI. I think that would totally. be something super exciting to do. But Matt, I appreciate you coming over here. This is my dude, Matt. And if you're not following him again, post up underneath here, find the touch points, make sure you connect to him, send him some love, show some love on content, visit him on Instagram at a fine press. And the name of his company once again is holy shit stationary. I appreciate you being here and I'll be on the lookout for more content coming right here to the channel in these weeks and months ahead. Thanks for watching. Love it. Thanks. Yeah, you bet, dude. I, dude. I so appreciate you. And I like, I can go so many different ways with the conversation.